my screening of the 3D high frame rate version of Avatar 2 was the worst visual experience I've had in a movie theater in some time. So much so that I, John Hess, a filmmaker IQ, the defender of 24 FPS, the guy that reacted poorly to Ang Lee's Gemini Man in 120 FPS, the guy that spent 42 minutes busting HFR myths, this guy, me, I would have rather watched a real three hour and 10 minute fully HFR version of Avatar 2 than the incomprehensible frame rate mess that was served in theaters last Thursday night. Let me explain here. Some screenings of Avatar 2 are advertised as high frame rate, but it's not high frame rate throughout, only parts, resulting in a constant switching back and forth that made it utterly impossible to watch. But first, I have to back up again and talk about the technology a bit because I'm sure a lot of people are coming, going to come to this video who are unfamiliar with what's going on. Now, film and narrative television shows are shot at 24 frames per second. 24 is the normal frame rate for cinema. Normal frame rate for cinema. But there are some things that are jarring at that frame rate, certain kinds of fast action. Traditionally, filmmakers just work inside those characteristics, mitigating them with motion blur and controlled composition, and occasionally breaking it for artistic intent, artistic effect. But the mainstreaming of 3D and high dynamic range can break the illusion of 24 FPS as 3D immersion feel demands a smoother image. And the super bright images of high dynamic range judder harder than the not so bright images of regular dynamic range. So a proposed solution is to up the frame rate. This creates smoother motion and less judder. The problem with that is it doesn't look like what we've grown accustomed to in our media culture as a movie. Because of this, screen acting suffers. Action suffers. Everything looks stagey. It just doesn't look like a movie. It's off-putting. And I'd be willing to bet there's a more fundamental reason beyond just, we're not used to it. After all, we've seen high frame rate in video for almost as many years as we've seen normal 24 FPS film. Now, you may disagree. I'm sure a lot of you do. But I pretty much covered every single complaint in one of my previous videos. I won't rehash everything here. So if you give me the benefit of the doubt about 24 FPS, then the sensible strategy would be to use high frame rate for some shots which need it, and then go back to 24 FPS for everything else. In speaking to an audience on the re-release of the original Avatar, James Cameron said, quote, we are using high frame rate to improve the 3D where we want a heightened sense of presence, such as underwater or in some flying scenes. For shots of just people standing around talking, high frame rate works against us because it creates a kind of hyper-realism in scenes that are more mundane, more normal. And sometimes we need that cinematic feeling of 24 FPS. Also note that he said to improve the 3D. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, in my videos on the topic, a lot of people have been telling me just that. Variable frame rate is the key. And I've been pushing back hard because switching frame rates, outside of animation, which switches between very low frame rates, Switching frame rates isn't the artistic tool that you think it is. It's an indication of a medium switch from cinematic film to live video. And we switch from 24 FPS to something higher, it stops looking like a movie and starts looking like something else. In the old days when we used to watch broadcast television, that was called the soap opera look. But no one young watches soap operas. Today, a better term might be the video game look. But let me back up again and break down how variable frame rates work, including a newer process I believe was introduced for this very movie. Now, first of all, we can't actually vary the frame rate in a projector. That's not a good idea because we'll lose sync. So we start with a high frame rate and subdivide that high frame rate by repeating frames. So imagine this ball traveling up and down. The x-axis represents time, which we divide into 48 frames per second. If we show the position of the ball for two frames in our 48 frame stream, that would be considered true 24 frames per second. If each frame of 48 shows a unique position of the ball, then that would be considered true 48 frames per second. That's the basics of embedding a lower frame rate into a higher frame rate. Now, here's a new technique that's being tried on Avatar. What if we go back to that 24 frame per second, but instead of showing two identical frames, we showed the in-between frame that is weighted more toward the previous frame. By doing this, we can sort of fine tune the look between straight 24, which has two identical frames, and full bore HFR 48, which each frame is totally unique. 
Now to do this weighted in between frame, we can employ frame rate interpolation, or if it's like CGI, it's just rendered that way. Or we can shoot at even higher frame rate, like 120 FPS, and pull an earlier frame to make up that in between frame for the 48 FPS. Now we can do this shot by shot, or even to only certain portions of the frame with some rotoscoping. So that's how you create variable frame rate in Avatar 2. As far as I know, the only movie to ever try using this process at the time of this writing. Now I might make a video on this topic in the future, we'll see. But remember what Cameron said, to improve the 3D, Avatar 2 has gotta have one of the most confusing release schedules I've ever seen. And by Edward Cinema, there are five different versions available on opening weekend. Standard 2D, 2D Screen X, which I frankly hate, Screen X, sometimes called 4X, is where they project gobbledygook on the sidewalls of the theater. It's just annoying. It's the definition of the Scorsese theme park ride movie. There's Real D 3D, Real D 3D 4X, which is that Screen X nonsense, and then IMAX 3D. If you look at the descriptions, only the Real D 3D and the Real D 4X are mentioned high frame rate. My IMAX 3D did not mention high frame rate, although I understand some theaters may have certain equipment that enables HFR laser projection for IMAX. Uh, it's like you need to actually be an expert in display tech just to understand which version to go to. Well, I went to an 8.30 p.m. Real D 3D screening last Thursday on opening weekend. There's only like seven people in the screening. So, let's see how it goes. And in the very first shot, the 20th Century Pictures logo orbit, you could already tell we're in HFR land. Here's the thing, and I've said this a lot of times, HFR looks great. HFR looks good on Avatar. HFR looked great on Gemini Man. But it doesn't look like a movie. And if that was it, I wouldn't be making this video because I'd just be covering old ground. But then again, YouTube wants me to cover old ground. No, the movie had to constantly switch the frame rates. Shaw the Navi flying around, high frame rate. Close up on their face, no, we're in 24 frames per second. Character moves, now we're in HFR. There's one scene where the main characters who are tree Navi meet up with the sea Navi. They talk, it's 24 FPS. But there we see the love interest, she's in HFR. Back to talking in 24 FPS, back to her, she's in 24 FPS now, back to talking, we're back in HFR. You would think there would be some sort of strategy of, of switching. You think maybe the shots, the vistas would be HFR and the talking scenes would be 20. No, it's just random. It just, it just totally, it becomes totally random, the switches. And this went on and on and on. The constant switching got so aggravating. I left the theater feeling seasick. Although that might have something to do with the high frame rate and the constant bobbing up and down of the ocean. See, what some of you youngins don't realize is that when I was young and my dad bought a video camera, those things only shot a high frame rate of 60i. They didn't have any lens stabilization whatsoever. So if you zoomed in while shooting handheld, I remember doing this on the Grand Canyon. If you zoomed in shooting handheld, it was a quick trip to Queasy Town. And Avatar stirred up those not so fond memories. Now, at this point, I'm willing to bet some of you out there, especially if you're watching this in the distant future, you're demanding that I show you examples. Well, as of writing this video, making this video, there are no publicly available official examples. Anything you find today in 2022 will be some interpolated garbage someone made. Remember, the HFR was only for the 3D shows, which wouldn't show up online anyway. I mean, there's a reason why they don't show the switching of the frame rates, cynically speaking, because it looks like garbage and they know it. But if you're still having trouble picturing what I'm talking about, imagine playing a first person shooter, you're clocking a very pedestrian 60 frames per second, and then you get to part of a game and the frame rate drops. Now do that over and over again randomly for three hours. That's how frustrating watching this movie was. Here's the thing about artistic compromise that I've been on and on about. If you love 24 FPS, you're not gonna like this switch over to HFR. If you love HFR, you're not gonna like switching back to 24 FPS. Compromise in this case means that everyone is miserable. So after that disaster of a screening, I knew I couldn't give the movie a fair shake unless I saw it again at a standard 
24 FPS. So Friday night, night after, I went to a 7.30 screening. This time, the theater was completely full of patrons, including a couple of children you know were really too young to be handling a three-hour movie. So forgetting about the switching, how was the HFR compared to the standard version? Well, the VFX animations actually looked pretty good, with a couple caveats. First, it, it did look like a beautifully rendered video game. It didn't look like a movie. It, it looked like a beautiful game. You know those campaigns of something like Battlefield or Call of Duty where you have to run through a level and everything's blowing up around you, boom, 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 and you're just like, you're just hanging on with for dear life. It looked just like that. And basically, from what I can tell, that's the draw for HFR enthusiasts. Make a big video game cutscene rendered in ultra, uber, chosen one quality mode, right? Unfortunately, it made things feel like they were weightless. Trains flew the air, copters crashed, all without any heft to them. There was... Zero sense of danger, just sparkly tame fireworks. Boom. Anytime soldiers' bodies were tossed about, they suffered that sort of fast motion effect and high frame rate, a bit of extra ragdoll physics. Did, you know, it just looks kind of fake. So the, the 24 FPS version did suffer a bit from that too. So it wasn't purely high frame rate, but not as much as the high frame rate does. It, high frame rate just betrays that, that fact much more visually. I also had a real hard time believing in the flight characteristics of the animals in the film. I found that to be an issue in both versions I saw. They're just too smooth. When the animal would flap its wings, you don't get a sense of it actually pushing air. It, the flying animals are treated like magic hover bikes. Minor quibble, someone's going to call me out for being a nitpicker, whatever. But both versions had that issue to me. I will say that the underwater scenes are definitely helped by HFR. They look good in 24 PS, but extra gooder in HFR. Maybe that's where smoothness and weightlessness work to the benefit of the effect. And I know the same feeling about that one water shot in Gemini Man. But that's for the VFX HFR. Anytime there was a human live actor in HFR, such as on the bridge of a, the big baddie ship, it had that traditional HFR soap opera fake look to it. The actors already felt a little like they were cutouts walking around a, a green screen set in 24, but in HFR, it's really obvious. It just looks small and mundane. Now, we all knew that going in, but the vast majority of the film is almost completely animated, so those live-action parts are almost a blink-and-you-miss-them situation. Now, that's not to say that the 24 FPS was perfect in terms of motion. Truthfully, some of the battle scenes felt like they were a bit too much judder. It did feel like a big, stroby mess at times. I can't help but wonder if that was just being reliant on the high frame rate version to smooth it out. So they just did a simple downsample for those 24 FPS shots. Because a lot of the rest of the movie, it looked really great. There was even one point late in my screening when the 24 FPS suddenly felt a lot smoother, as if maybe they cranked up the motion blur. I think this leads some people to think that the 24 FPS was also HFR. I'm almost certain it wasn't because I've been doing that, is that 24 FPS game on YouTube? Ever since that uh, YouTube algorithm dubbed me the frame rate guy. Thing is, 24 FPS can look extremely smooth and extremely juddery, depending on the motion blur. But the, there's an underlying motion of 24 that isn't there in high frame rate, even if it is smooth. Ultimately, I would say the execution of the motion of this film in 24 FPS is very, very sloppy. Given the fact that there are so many versions of this movie in theaters, that these details are going to be noticed by only a few weirdo boomers like me on the internet, Quality control probably got laxed. Now, Although marketing would have you believe that they spent 13 years trying to perfect this film, they really didn't. Stuff like this always gets pushed into crunch time. So to sum things up, as much as I do not like HFR in my movies, I would rather sit through a complete 100% HFR version than to be continuously assaulted with constant and random frame rate switches that this version has. It wasn't until I watched the 24 FPS version could I appreciate what was going on. Now, true, I had the benefit of familiarity seeing it a second time, but now the only distraction was that kindergartner in the row ahead of me babbling random stuff before his auntie took him out of the theater. Now, for the film itself, as an artistic creator myself, I can't help but marvel at the quality of the visual effects involved. It feels cliche and hackney to say they were groundbreaking. Because I don't know if they really broke ground necessarily in the macro sense, but maybe in the micro sense. Individual elements like the water effects are so perfectly believable that they might as well have shot them in a water tank. The story does feel heavy and long, but I appreciate that it felt at least cohesive 
at least thought through properly. There's not this major logic boners and pretense off the bat that seem to plague a lot of big action superhero movies these days. So I can say that I recognize the level of work put into it. I might go so far as to say it was a technical masterpiece in some respects. But frankly, I just didn't connect with it emotionally. The family elements were too cliche and generic. I just don't have an affinity for the Na'vi. To me, they're uninteresting puppets with very limited range of emotion. Their distress is either crying, bawling their eyes out, or hissing with no nuance in between. On this hissing point, I've got to elaborate more because I think people will think it's a small point when it really encapsulates a whole lot more. The Na'vi are constantly hissing at each other, which to me reads as the ultimate insult, <laughs> right? In the scene I described earlier where Sully meets the water people, their wives who are opposed to this kind of source proto-union are hissing at each other right away. Like, to me, that just feels stupid. If this is a real play with real people, you can build layers. You, you know, the meaning may be cordial, but you can hide the disdain in sharp words, a raised eyebrow, or quick cross glance. And the fun for the viewer is decoding the clues to get that subcontext of the scene. That gets you emotionally immersed into what's going on. But here it's just... <laughs> It's the dumbest of dumb. There's nothing there. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb. It's brilliant. No! It's just dumb. And for all the hoopla about visual immersion, there was no emotional immersion. No one character that I could feel as my personal avatar in Pandora, my entryway into the story. Oh, well, it's an enjoyable popcorn movie. It's a beautifully rendered video game cutscene. If you like the original Avatar, I think this one will probably be even better. Or if you want to just watch something that has a lot of action and splody James Cameron, boom! It's not a bad way to burn three hours. Just stay away from the atrocious HFR versions with that incessant frame rate switching. Ugh. Like and subscribe, ring that bell, donate on Patreon if you are so inclined. Leave an angry comment reacting to the title alone with no evidence that you actually watched any of the video. And you might win a chance for a special buy one, get that one offer on the official Filmmaker IQ merch in the shelf below. Can you believe it? Okay, until next time we meet guys, go make something great. I'm John Hess signing off for filmmakeriq.com.